welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. I want to say a special welcome, Ann Frank, Hotchkiss, Bishop Arts, Idaho, Walnut Hill, David Burnett, Gilbert Quayar, William Lipscomb, Arthur Kramer, Rosemont, Winnetka, Virtual Academy, Chapel Hill, uh, Sam Houston, and Reinhardt. Thank you so much for joining us on this cold winter day. Teachers, if you're watching, if you have not signed up, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash PK-2 registration. Fill out a short form for us, please. Uh, program today is basic needs of plants during this virtual field trip. Students will differentiate between living and non-living things based upon whether they have basic needs and produce offspring and examine evidence that plants have basic needs such as air, water, nutrients, sunlight, and space. Mr. Monroe will tell you all about living things, non-living things by Ms. Ramirez. Basic needs of plants, Mr. Dominguez, and Ms. Ram will tell you how plants produce offspring. Students, you cannot ask us a verbal question during this program, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash question space answer to send in a question and we'll do our best to answer it during the program. If not, I'll send the answer to your teachers and they can discuss it with you. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Monroe is going to tell you all about Hello everyone, my name is Mr. Monroe and we're going to be, ah, I guess the best way to start it off. How do you know if an object is living, if it's alive? Because that's what we're going to be looking at, the characteristics of living things. Now, I had a firsthand experience about a couple of years ago while I was out in the front yard of my house, I was doing a little work in the flower beds. I glanced over at the lawn and I noticed an object that I'd never seen there before. Upon look, looking at the object, I just assumed that somebody had tossed a rock up in my front yard. It looked very much like this. Well, I stood there watching it for a while. First thing that I was looking for to determine whether it was alive or not is if it was going to move. Well, it never did move. It just stayed in that one position. Well, I got up close to it and I observed something else. It began to move. And what I found out, instead of it being a rock that was motionless, it was actually a box turtle, just like the one I'm holding here. And of course, when I got real close to it, it began to move. Now, Teresa here, the box turtle that I have here in my lab, it's kind of cold in here, so she's not doing a lot of moving. She's coming out now. But that little three-toed box turtle, once it saw me get too close, it really began to move. I don't know how people think that turtles are very slow, but Teresa, that turtle that was like Teresa began to move very fast. And that let me know that she was alive. And we cannot use that as a determining factor, whether something is alive or not, whether it's still or not. Because we know that plants, they don't move. You don't ever see a plant just pull up its roots and start moving around looking for something to eat, do we? That plant's gonna be very still. It's gonna stand there with its roots embedded in the soil, and it's gonna take in some things that it needs, which we call basic needs, and it's not going to move. So there are other characteristics that really help us determine whether something is living or not. Now, the rock, it did not move. And the rock really doesn't have any basic needs to fulfill, right? It's just going to be there. Now, as far as the basic needs, Let's start out by talking about living things are made up of little bitty tiny, I guess you might say it's the smallest unit of life. They are called cells. Every living thing is made up of cells. And these cells have very special 
jobs that they do. Now, cells are part of certain types of tissue. And the tissue is made up of, it makes up certain organs that are in a living thing's body. And then the organs make up organ systems, such as the cardiac system or the circulatory system or the respiratory system that is found in humans or people. Now, those cells help the living thing go through what we call life process. Now, listen guys, when you are a living thing to go through life processes, living things use energy. Now, where do they get the energy from? Well, basically, the ultimate source of energy for living things on our planet is the sun. We can look at some of the living things that live around us that we call plants. Or we can look at the animals that live around us, including ourselves. We all use energy. And as far as plants are concerned, they use the energy from the sun to go ahead and make their own food within their own body structure. As far as animals and ourselves, we have to eat something else. And what we eat, for example, we do eat plants. We're getting some of the sun's energy from the plants that we consume. Now, plants are considered to be producers simply because they take in three main ingredients to make their own food. They take in sunlight, they take in water, and they take in something called carbon dioxide. It's a gas that actually we breathe out, okay? Now, plants and animals, even living things that it may fall in between that. We have microorganisms, all that. They respond to stimuli. And then what that means is they respond to something outside of their body if the conditions are just right. Take, for example, today, it's very cold. I went outside without my heavy coat a few minutes ago, and I began to shiver because it was so cold outside. That was me responding to an outside stimuli. A puppy will do the same thing. A dog will do the same thing. If it gets too cold, the first response to that stimuli, which is the cold air, is to start shivering. Now, plants also will respond to an outside stimuli. I have an ivy plant right here. And if you look at it, most of the growth is going to one direction. It's going that way. Well, I can remember when this plant was in my house, it was sitting on a table and to this direction, there was a lamp, there was a light source. And the plant's response to that light being over here was to start growing toward that light. Because what did I say earlier? Plants need light. So it was going to something that it basically needs, okay? now. There are some basic needs for living things. They need food, water, shelter, and space. Well, for this plant to get its food, what did it have to have? It had to have a light source. So that's what it was growing toward. This outside stimuli was drawing it to it. Now, something else that living things do, living things reproduce. Plants usually reproduce by producing seeds, okay? And that seed uh, would be something like this acorn. Now, one of the things that I want you to remember, if you were here with us today and it wasn't so cold outside, we would be taking a walk on one of our nature trails and you would hear me talking about all the plants that are found in our forest over there. Now, one of the things I want you to remember, maybe I'll see you in the future, maybe we'll get a chance to take that hike in, in the Post Oak Preserve, is that the, the Post Oak Preserve is called the Post Oak Preserve simply because the most common plant that we have over there, and a lot of people don't really realize this, but trees are plants also, aren't they? The most common plant that we have over there, and I want you to remember this in case your teacher asks you later on, is the Post Oak Tree. 
Trees are plants and they make their own food. Now, if we were over there today, you probably wouldn't see a lot of greenery. You wouldn't see any leaves. And you might even think the tree is dead, but simply because we don't have a lot of sunlight, our daylight time is very short during the winter months. And so basically a lot of those trees, because they're not getting enough sunlight, they've gone into what we call dormancy. They've gone into hibernation like a bear. When will they wake up? When we start getting a little more daylight during the day in the season of spring. But the oak trees produce a seed to help them reproduce because if conditions get just right, the acorn will also produce a new tree of the same kind. That's what reproduction is. Just like Teresa, she's a female, turtles lay eggs to reproduce, okay? And also that animal or that plant that is growing from the seed or from the egg, it is called an offspring. Now over time, the offspring are going to grow and develop. That is another characteristic of living things, growing bigger and developing. That's something that living things do. And then they also adapt or they change with their environment. Just like the post oak trees over there, they're gonna grow their leaves back when they start getting more daylight and the air temperature warms up. That means they're changing because of their surroundings, the air and the amount of light has changed. Now, I'm gonna share this with you. An offspring that is caused by a seed going through development, the seed starts sprouting right here and it grows roots and there's part of it above the ground, that is called a seedling. That would be the offspring of that particular plant. Let's say that a chicken lays an egg. And that egg, once the egg hatches from the female chicken and the chicken sits on it, guess what? For 21 days, if the chicken sits on it, the hen sits on it, a new baby chick is going to be born. And I had something happen just a minute ago. It's not really about plants, but I've got a cartonic quail here. And I just happened to look down at her in her cage and she laid an egg right there. I saw her do it. So I want to share that with you guys. Come here, Matthew. This is Bessie, the Sertonix twail, quail. And I tell you what, she's a good girl. She just laid this little egg, guys. And you know what? If she was to sit on this egg for about 18 days, guess what would happen? she would get an offspring. It would hatch into the same kind of animal that she is. That's reproduction, okay? So hopefully I've helped you understand a little bit about how we can identify living things from non-living things. If any of you have any questions, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman and I bet he can answer those for you. You guys have Thank a good you. day. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, question, name a plant that lives in your front yard or in a park near you. Uh, a red oak tree lives in a park near me. Okay, and now Ms. Ramirez is going to tell you all about non-living things. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, we're gonna be learning about non-living things. So. Here are two of my favorite non-living things. These are rocks. And we know that rocks are non-living because they do not have basic needs. So they do not need food. They do not need water. They also do not grow and they cannot reproduce. So they can't make offspring or have little baby rocks. So these things are non-living. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll look at a quick presentation to learn all about non-living things. So let me share our screen. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is name two non-living things in an ecosystem. The second is, is the sun living? Why or why not? So let's look at some characteristics of non-living things. 
non-living things are not alive. Now you learned about living things with Mr. Monroe and you learned that living things have needs that help them to survive. Non-living things do not have basic needs because they're not alive. So non-living things, they don't need food or water. They do not breathe. They do not reproduce or have offspring and they do not grow. So look at some of the non-living things that we have here on these slides. These are all non-living or not alive. Now I'm gonna go ahead and share with you guys a little video and y'all are gonna learn a little song to learn the difference between living and non-living. I know I am not a singer, uh, but feel free to sing along um, as we learn the difference between living and non-living. So let me get us out of this presentation and I will pull up our video. It is living, it is living, I know why, I know why, it breathes, flows and needs food, it's alive, it's alive, it is non-living, it is non-living, I know why, I know why, it does and breathes, Living things breathe, living things grow. Living things reproduce, don't you know? If none of that happens, it's just a thing. It's not alive, it's non-living. Hello, we're gonna be playing a little game. You guys are gonna decide if the pictures that I show you are living, or non-living. Now, instead of shouting out the answers, you guys are gonna use your hands to let your teachers know what you think. So if you think it is a living thing, you're gonna make an L with your fingers like this. So go ahead and practice that. Show me an L for living. If you think the thing that I'm showing you guys is non-living, you're gonna take your thumb and put it in between the two fingers just like this. So this means an N and that stands for non-living. Okay, so if I show you something and it's living, you're gonna do an L. If I show you something and it's non-living, you're gonna show me an N, just like this. So L for living, N for non-living. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and play our game and we'll see how many of you guys get correct. So here's our game. It's the living or non-living game. So I hope you guys are ready. So here's our first thing and it is rocks. So do you think rocks are living or non-living? Go ahead and show your teacher with your hand. And hopefully you guys said that rocks are non-living. So you guys should have a fit. And by the way, this is actually American Sign Language for the letter N. So N stands for non-living. What about Fish, what do you guys think fish are? Are fish living or non-living? So go ahead and show your teacher with your hand. What do you think they are? Hmm. And hopefully you guys said fish are living things. So you guys should have a nice big L. Fish are living things, so they are alive, just like us. So the next one is water. So do you think water is living or non-living? Go ahead and show your teacher with your hands. And hopefully you guys said that water is non-living. So you guys should have a fist up. 
Now, remember we said rocks were non-living. Now, rocks, even though they're not alive, they're super important. Rocks can provide shelter for animals. And what do you think is hiding underneath this rock? So make a guess really quick. What might be hiding underneath this rock? I'm gonna lift it up and it's a frog. And that frog is a living thing. So rocks, which are non-living, can provide shelter for living things like our frog and other animals. So even though something's not alive, it is still very important to the living things in an environment. What about a cat? Do you think cats are living or non-living? He is our work cat that lives at our school. And hopefully you guys said that cats are, show me with your hands, cats are living things. Okay, next one up is clouds. Go ahead and show your teacher with your hands. And hopefully you guys said that clouds are non-living things. Uh, so clouds are non-living. Now, even though they're not alive, we still need them because they actually help to give us the rain. What about the wind? We can't see the wind with our eyes, but I know it's a windy day because you might see a windmill. The windmill is the object that is turning around and around. So do you think the wind is a living thing or non-living thing? So go ahead and show your teachers with your hand. And even if you don't have a wind meal at school or home, you know it's windy because you can look at the trees. If the trees are moving, that means there's wind. And hopefully you guys said the wind is non-living. So you should have your hand in a fist. So the wind is not alive. It can move things but it's not a living thing. The wind is non-living. Well, here's another fun one, the sun. We see the sun almost every day. It's so pretty and bright. Do you guys think the sun is living or non-living? So go ahead and show your teacher with your hand. And we know that the sun is a non-living Thing. So you should have your hand like this. Here's our next one, Mr. Donkey. So Donkey, do you think he is living or non-living? He's an easy one. Uh, so notice that Donkey here is eating. He's actually eating an apple. He also loves to eat grass and hay. I gave you a hint. So hopefully you guys said Donkey is a living thing. So let's look at the soil or dirt. Do you guys think that is living or non-living? Show me with your hands. And hopefully you guys said soil is non-living. It is not alive. But I also see some living things in this video. Of course, we see the plants. Plants are living things. They grow and reproduce. They need food and water. Plants are alive. And we know that the living and the non-living things make up what's called an environment. Can you guys say that word? Environment. So look at all those birds. We have the clouds and the sun. We have a pond. So an environment consists of living things and non-living things. So just remember, examples of living things would be things like plants, trees, animals, and then non-living things that can be found outside in the outside environment are things like the sun, the water, the soil or the dirt, rock, and the wind. Those are all examples of non-living things. So my challenge for you guys is to go outside with an adult and see if you guys can find some examples of living things and non-living things. And that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, we're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. And we did have a question. 
Name a non-living thing in your classroom. The light fixture. Okay, and now Mr. Dominguez is going to tell you all about the basic needs of plants. Hola amigos, en esta parte de su paseo virtual vamos a hablar de las plantas y todas las cosas que necesitan las plantas para crecer. Hi friends, in this part of your virtual field trip, we are going to talk about plants and everything they need to grow. As you can see here, my friend Teddy loves plants. Some of his favorite foods are papaya, turnip greens, and squash, and all of those things come from plants. My favorite fruit is banana, and bananas come from trees, and trees are plants. So we're going to take a very special trip down to our local hardware store where we are going to purchase some plants and I am going to show you everything that they need so they grow big and strong and later can be used as food. We'll leave Teddy alone to enjoy his papaya. He definitely loves the stuff. So let's get started. Estoy aquí en la tienda amigos y pienso que voy a comprar un poquito de acelga. La acelga es un relativo de la lechuga. So I'm here at the store, friends, and I think I'm going to buy a little bit of chard today. Chard is a leafy green that is a relative to lettuce. And I'm sure you guys have had lettuce before, maybe on a salad or a burger. And it's just a reminder of how important plants are as a food resource. Look at all this beautiful green color. And plants are green because they have a very special pigment called chlorophyll that helps them absorb light. And that's going to be important later on. So I'm back home and I'm ready to plant my chard. And the first thing that plants need in order to grow healthy and strong is good soil, buena tierra. Just like you guys get all of the nutrients and vitamins you need from the foods you eat, plants get all of those nutrients from the soil that they live in. And plants absorb all of those nutrients through their roots. So check out the roots of this chard plant. There's a ton of them. These roots will help this plant absorb not only water, but nutrients from the soil. The next thing that plants need in order to survive is light, la luz. Without light, a very special process called photosynthesis would not be able to happen. Photosynthesis is the process by which plants produce or make their own food. Unlike you and I, who consume or eat other living things in order to survive, plants do not, and instead make their own sugar or food through the process called photosynthesis. But without light, that would just not be possible. In fact, the word photosynthesis comes from the two words, photo and synthesis. Photo means light, and synthesis means to make. So you are making something from light and that's exactly what plants do. The last thing my plant will need to grow successfully is water, agua. Water is important to plants for several reasons. Water contains nutrients that help plants grow. Water carries nutrients from the soil to the outermost part of a plant like the leaves and water is also required for photosynthesis. So the three basic needs of a plant are soil, water and light. So let's give this chart plant its first watering and hopefully come summer I have a big beautiful plant that I can use to feed my animals. Now before I let you guys go today I want to show you guys some of the animals that we have here at the EEC that use plants as a food source. So let's go. These box turtles are omnivores which means that they eat both plants and animals but some of the plants that they do enjoy are papaya, yellow squash, and collard greens. And those pellets that you see are made of different types of grasses. These are the wonderful cows we have here at the EEC. You guys might have gotten the opportunity to feed them before. And as you guys know, they are herbivores, which means that they only eat plants. So they enjoy all kinds of different grasses and are definitely some of my favorite animals here at the center. If we walk a little bit further down the EEC, we'll find our pigs and our goats. Goats are, of course, herbivores, and pigs are omnivores. But that means that they eat plenty of plants. As you can see, they are munching on some grass right now. 
if you guys were here in person and were to have lunch with us, all of the leftover plant material that you guys don't eat, like your carrots, broccoli, or cauliflower, all of those things would go to our pigs and goats because we don't like to waste anything around here at our beautiful center. But don't worry, while you guys are away, we are feeding them some of the plants that we've grown ourselves. All right, guys, the last animals I wanted to show you today are the birds we have here at the EEC. And while these birds are omnivores, that means that they eat both plants and animals, most of their diet is plant-based. We only occasionally give them mealworms as treats. But before I let you guys go today, I wanted to mention something very important about plants and photosynthesis. When photosynthesis is occurring, remember the process that helps plants produce their own food, a very special gas is released into our atmosphere, and that gas is oxygen. Oxygen is part of the air that we breathe. So not only do we use plants as a food source, plants also provide us with the oxygen that we need to survive. So without plants, no humans, no you. So thank you, plants. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this part of your virtual field trip. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. And the question is, one thing that all plants need, and that is sunlight. And now Ms. Schramm is gonna tell you about plants producing their offspring. Hey everybody, it's me, Ms. Schramm, and today we are talking all about seeds and plants. So let's get started with our little presentation. And here we go. All right, so at the end of my part of the field trip, you'll be able to examine evidence that plants have basic needs such as water, nutrients, sunlight, and space. And we are gonna start with seeds today. So our central questions today are, do non-living things reproduce? And what is a seed? And I have some examples of seeds on the left and we're gonna see some real life examples too. But seeds come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. But first, let's talk about that non-living things reproducing. We know that living things reproduce. We were babies once. We have baby animals, maybe kitties and doggies. Maybe your classroom is gonna hatch butterflies. And we also know that plants reproduce and they use seeds. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But do non-living things reproduce? If you leave a chair in the room, are you gonna get a baby chair? No. Or do teddy bears have babies? No. Do cars have babies? No. Living thi non living things do not reproduce. They do not make more. Living things do reproduce. So we're going to talk about how plants reproduce, and that is through seeds. So, what is a seed? Seeds are the small parts produced by plants from which new plants can grow. So as a plant goes through its life cycle, it creates seeds that can drop and fall onto the soil. When rain comes, they grow into a new plant so that next year there's more plants. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna look at some seeds that I have here in my classroom because I love gardening. Gardening is one of my favorite things to do. And I do a lot of it out here at the environmental center. And so I have a ton of seeds. So I've got a huge seed collection, all different kinds of plants. We can grow flowers, we can grow vegetables, herbs, all sorts of crazy things. So I wanted to show you some um, sunflower seeds because sunflower seeds are nice and big. They're easy for little hands to plant and they're so beautiful when they grow. So I'm gonna take a few out so you could see. Now, it's not really the time to plant sunflower seeds. Sunflowers love summer. And even though it felt pretty warm the other day, it's gonna get kind of chilly this weekend and it's already kind of cold out now. So we're gonna see hopefully after spring break, that's a good time to start putting plants outside. But for now, we can start planting some things inside. So I've got my sunflower seeds here. I also have um, different wildflower mixes. 
these are ones that I would want to take outside and sprinkle right on the ground. So I'm not going to put them in a little pot and then bring them out. But something I will start in pots inside, and now is a great time to start while it's still cold out, is tomatoes and peppers. So I really like cherry tomatoes because they're a great snack. They're healthy. And you just whoop, pop them in your mouth like a grape. So I'm going to plant some of these today, and y'all are going to help me. And we actually offer seeds and um, little pots and soil here at the Environmental Center if your teacher orders them from the Living Materials Center. So I'm gonna use some of those same tools and we are going to plant um, a few seeds. So we have these little peat pots and they're small, they um, are biodegradable and we um, ship these off to schools um, through the Living Materials Center. But also if you use a toilet paper roll, you can fold the bottoms in and it makes um, a similar little thing. So all we're gonna use is potting soil, which like I said, you can get from us or you can get at the store if you wanna do this at home with your grownups. And all I'm gonna do is, see, I'm just gonna scoop a little bit and it doesn't have to be totally full, but for the shake, for the sake of showing you, I'm gonna get it mostly full. Okay, so there we go. Then I'm gonna get my seeds. So what did I say? I was gonna do cherry tomatoes. Oh yeah, they look pretty good. Maybe I'll even stick them in a salad. Let's see. Oh my god, oh, there we go. Ah! Okay, so that's a lot of seeds. Now we know that plants need water and sunlight and nutrients from their soil, but they also need space. So I cannot put all of those seeds in there. I'm just gonna put maybe three because ideally I would just put one, but not all seeds germinate or start to grow. So I just put three in and I'm gonna tuck them in with my finger, just a little poke and make sure they're all tucked in. Then I gotta put my other pepper seeds back in the bag, which will be quite interesting since they're so, so tiny. Okay, so I have my three seeds inside. Now I'm just gonna take some water and I'm just gonna give it a little spritz. All right, so the top is wet and I'm gonna have to spritz them like every day, maybe once when I arrive at school in the morning, once in the afternoon. Um, and the reason I'm not using a watering can is because once those sprouts start to come out and it starts to grow, they're not gonna be very strong. And so if I were to dump a lot of water, um, they might get damaged or squished by the water because it's really heavy. So I just use a little spritz and that'll give them enough moisture and enough water. And then when they're big adult plants, then we can put them outside, they'll get rain, you can water them with a the hose, all that. But for now, we're just gonna stick to a spray bottle. So let me plant a few more things. Now, these are some giant um, hot chili peppers, and I think I wanna plant some of those. So I'm gonna open this up, boom, boom, boom. Let's see what these seeds look like. Okay, you can see the cherry tomatoes were small, and these pepper seeds are small too, but not quite as little. So these are a little larger. And different vegetables have different shaped seeds. I'm gonna put all but three back. I think I'm gonna stick with the number three. Now I'm gonna take another peat pot and scoop, fill it mostly right up. Stick my seeds in there. Maybe I'm gonna spread them out so they have a little space just in case they all do germinate. And then I'm gonna tuck them in. And then what comes next? Couple spritzes, make sure it's moist. And then we wait. All right, so different seeds take a different amount of time to grow. So you can have your grownups help you and see how long it will take. Those cherry tomatoes will take about two weeks to germinate. So that means it's two weeks until I see the seed starting to grow and sprout out. And same for the chili peppers. So those will take about two weeks before I will see them growing. So I have to be very patient, which is really hard 
but I'm just gonna have to keep watering them and keep waiting. And then soon enough, I'll have new baby plants. So one thing I did forget, which is like so bananas, is I forgot to write on the side what I planted. So now I'm gonna have to wait and see which one is which when it starts to grow. And luckily I've grown a lot of vegetables before, so hopefully I'll be able to tell quite quickly. Um, but if you do this, make sure you write on the peat pots to say what you're planting or whatever you use as your seed starters. Uh, make sure you label what's going on in there. And you can even use a popsicle stick with um, writing on it and stick it in the soil next to it. Um, just so you know what you're growing and then you can expect um, when it's gonna pop out and everything like that. So that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for joining me. I can't wait to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Ram. Question, do you have to have a seed to grow a new plant? No, some plants can be produced by a process called plant propagation. Okay, now we're gonna share the screen. During this virtual field trip, students differentiated between living and non-living things based upon whether they have basic needs, produce offspring, and examine evidence that plants have basic needs such as air, water, nutrient, sunlight, and space. Mr. Monroe covered living spring, living things, non-living things by Ms. Ramirez, basic needs of plants by Mr. Dominguez, and plants produce offspring by Ms. Schramm. Thank you for joining us. Teachers, if you would, go to www.tiny.cc slash pk-2 feedback, fill out a short form and send it back to us. We would appreciate it. And now you guys have a great rest of the cold afternoon. Thank you for joining us.